I moved to Israel when I was 16 years old, back in the year 1990. Yitzhak Rabin became prime minister in Israel in the year 1992, and he then pushed forward with the Oslo peace process in 1993. I still have vivid memories of protesting against the peace process and arguing with people that back then telling them that not only will a peace process with our terrorist enemies who call themselves Palestinians not bring peace any closer, but it would actually push peace further away and bring war and terror closer instead. Now stick with me as I break down Rabin's peace legacy and expose it as one big lie. On November 4th, 1995, Israel's former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. Ever since that day, the leaders and publicists of Israel's left have used the anniversary of his assassination to celebrate his legacy of peace and delegitimize their opponents, the right-wing religious population of Israel, who they blame for his assassination. Now, before we delve into the latest hypocrisy of the left regarding Rabin's assassination, let us first do a deep dive into the true legacy of former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. We are told that the legacy of former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is one of the Prime Minister responsible for ushering Israel into the era of peace, specifically referring to the Oslo peace process where the state of Israel gave a terror organization, the PLO Palestine Liberation Organization, guns and autonomy to rule in our land in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Basically, Rabin recognized one of the most notorious terror organizations in the world at the time, the PLO, and started a peace process with them. Israelis are told year after year in educational materials and schools, television programs, cultural events, memorial ceremonies, etc., that we must remember Rabin's legacy as a strong IDF military man, seriously concerned for Israel's security, who had the courage to make peace with our enemies because you only make peace with your enemies. Not only that, but we are told constantly that Rabin was a supporter of the two-state solution and for dividing Jerusalem into two separate entities so that our terrorist enemies, the PLO, can also have their capital city in Jerusalem. That is the Rabin legacy that Israeli society is told to remember year after year. However, this official legacy is one big lie. First of all, Yitzhak Rabin was forced into the Oslo peace process by his political rival Shimon Peres. Rabin himself did not push for the Oslo peace talks with the PLO or support it. As an important aside, it is important to know that it was actually forbidden according to Israeli law for any Israeli to talk with representatives of the PLO. It was a law on the books. It was Rabin's foreign minister, Shimon Peres, who went against Israeli law and secretly sent Israeli representatives to begin talks with representatives of the PLO terror organization behind Rabin's back, and it was Rabin who was prime minister. So Shimon Peres, Israel's foreign minister, went against Israeli law in starting the Oslo peace process. Then, once it was a fact on the ground, with the support of international countries, Perez, in a sense, forced Rabin into a corner to approve it. Because once the Oslo peace process was a fait accompli with international support, Rabin would have looked horrible for not approving it. Now, the next lie about Rabin's Oslo legacy is that Rabin supported the two-state solution in dividing Jerusalem. In reality, Rabin was a security hawk and he never ever mentioned support for the two-state solution or for dividing Jerusalem. This is a critical, critical historical truth that has been hidden from the public. All one has to do is follow Rabin's public statements. Go Google them. He was very careful with his words. In Rabin's final speech before the Israeli Knesset on October 5th, 1995, a month before he was killed, Rabin said exactly what his vision was for peace. First, he started with his vision for Jerusalem. Quote, First and foremost, a united Jerusalem as the capital of Israel under Israeli sovereignty. Unquote. How clear can it be? 
that Rabin was extremely and strongly against ever, ever dividing Jerusalem. Then when it came to Judea and Samaria and even Gaza, he was also very clear. Again, quoting from Rabin's final speech in the Knesset, quote, Changes which will include the addition of Gush Etzion, Efrat, Beitar, and other communities, most of which are in the area east of what was the Green Line prior to the Six-Day War, unquote. Rabin's words were clear as day. It called for extending Israeli sovereignty to all the settlement blocks in Judea and Samaria. Rabin committed to taking no action to stop the expansion of Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria, and he also specifically ruled out any construction freeze in those communities. He also praised the Israeli communities in the Gaza Strip, signaling strongly that they would also never be given up by Israel. Rabin also said that Israel's eastern border would remain the Jordan Valley in perpetuity, with Israel defending the border with Jordan. Hence, Rabin nullified any realistic option for the creation of an independent state called Palestine responsible for its own border security. Not only did Rabin not mention any vision of a state called Palestine sitting side by side with Israel that had its capital in Jerusalem, but his vision was actually more like Netanyahu's vision of a demilitarized less than state for the Palestinian Arabs, with Israel having total control of all the borders and with Israelis living in communities throughout Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, because back in 1993, Jews still lived in Gaza. So the left's agenda of pushing the narrative that Rabin's legacy as a peace man who supported establishing a state called Palestine with a divided Jerusalem as their capital is one huge lie. That is not Rabin's legacy at all. Do you want to know Rabin's true legacy in connection to the Oslo peace process? Well, again, let's listen to Rabin the security man himself. On March 1st, 1994, on Israeli television, Rabin voiced support for the Oslo peace process because, as he said in Hebrew, quote, Hamishtara palestini tilachem b'chamas b'li b'tselem b'li b'gatz u'bli imahot neged shtia. The English translation for what Rabin said on television at that time is as follows. Quote, the Palestinian Authority police will fight against the Hamas without the obstacles of Israel's High Court of Justice and the leftist NGOs of B'Tselem and Mothers Against Silence, etc. Do you hear that? To Rabin, the peace process was not about living peacefully with our Palestinian Arab enemies. No, Rabin supported the peace process because he was led to believe that the Palestinian Authority terrorists would destroy the Hamas and stop them from killing innocent Israelis. Rabin back in 1993 and all Israeli governments since all are not able to properly stop our terrorist enemies from killing us because Israel's justice system, together with many left-wing NGOs funded by the European Union, U European countries and other international actors, they create legal hurdles and stop Israel from protecting ourselves. So Rabin was led to believe that by giving the PLO terrorists guns and autonomy in our ancestral homeland, that they would fight and defend Israel and Israelis against the worst terrorists of Hamas. Israelis and Israeli leaders actually believed that the horrendous PLO terrorists could be trusted to help defend Israel against other terrorists. That was Rabin's security rationale for the failed Oslo peace process that I tried to warn people about back in 1993. Now, getting back to the official peace legacy of former Prime Minister Rabin, the other aspect of his legacy, which is very, very ugly, and a huge blight upon our nation is that the left uses his assassination as a political tool to delegitimize their political opponents, the religious Zionist right in Israel, like me. One can draw a parallel between how the left in Israel uses the Rabin assassination and the way the left in America today is using the January 6th event at the Capitol building in DC to delegitimize the whole right-wing conservative movement in the United States. The man who pulled the trigger, former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, was a religious Jew labeled a right-wing extremist. However, what the left and the establishment media and school books all conveniently leave, leave out is that 
his killer was recruited and handled by an Israeli Secret Service agent. So, while the man in jail for Rabin's murder was recruited by an Israeli Secret Service agent named Avishai Raviv, codenamed Champagne, the Secret Service agent himself lives life as a free man. He got away scot-free. Still today, this issue is making headlines. As just two days ago, an Israeli investigative reporter uncovered that another one of the right-wing extremists who was connected with the Rabin assassination was a secret police agent back then, together working with Avishai Raviv of the Shabak. So we can see that Rabin's assassination was very possibly a false flag event similar to January 6th created by powerful people with links to the secret services to then delegitimize the whole right-wing Zionist religious conservative population in Israel. And this delegitimization process still continues to this day. At the recent memorial ceremony for Rabin in the Knesset, Israel's left-wing foreign minister Yair Lapid used his speech for exactly that purpose, to delegitimize the right-wing religious conservative population in Israel, stating, and I quote, Rabin assassins' ideological heirs are serving in Knesset today. He totally incited against half of the Israeli population. Too bad Foreign Minister Lapid isn't listening to his late father, journalist and then politician, Tommy Lapid. Just listen. I think that Folks, it is up to us to promote the true legacy of Rabin. Rabin was a strong security hawk who cared about protecting Israel and Israelis, who was hoodwinked by his own foreign minister to support a destructive process misnamed peace that really gave guns and land to an enemy that was not interested in bringing peace, but by bringing about more terror and violence to kill Israel and destroy the Jewish state of Israel. And on top of that, Rabin's true legacy is that his murder was very possibly a political false flag act to harm the fabric of Israeli society and delegitimize half of the Israeli population. The only way to help heal the divisions in our society today in Israel is to share these truths so that future generations do not get sucked into spiraling societal divide based on the lies of the official Rabin legacy. And the same thing also applies for Americans regarding the truth about the events in D.C. at the Capitol building on January 6th. It is up to us, the simple people, to share the truth about these events in order to stop the societal division that certain political leaders, so they mostly all happen to be on the left, are trying to create together with the agenda-driven media. Again, folks, it is up to us. Stick with me for the continuing truths that we all must share. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.